Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Real Atheology, a Philosophy of Religion podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Watkins, and I'm joined by my co-host, John Lopolito. Did I say that right? Not Did quite. John Lopolito. <laughs> Lopolito. Dang it. One of these days. I'm telling you, I'm going to get it. And we are joined today um, by Jason Thibodeau. Did I say that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And um, today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Euthyphro Dilemma. But before that, I, uh, Jason, could you just uh, give us a brief introduction about yourself and what it is you do and write in the philosophy of religion? Sure. I'm a, a philosophy professor at Cypress College, which is a community college in Southern California. Um, and I write about uh, primarily about um, ethics or philosophy of religion and how that intersects with the issue of ethics. Um, so I write for the Secular Outpost blog and almost everything I write there has to do with, um, ethics from, you know, you know, within the field of philosophy of religion. So, uh, it's a bit of a tradition on our podcast, um, to ask why philosophy of religion? Um, why do you think it's important and, uh, what drew you to it in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. When I was in graduate school, I wasn't, I don't know if I could say I wasn't at all interested, but it was very much a minor concern of mine. I did my dissertation in um, philosophy of language slash history of analytic philosophy. Um, and philosophy of religion was not a part of my dissertation at all. It wasn't until my first teaching job, was, which was at Auburn University, that I got more interested in it. And I think it was because if I can remember back that long ago, um, it was because I was teaching ethics and I always taught divine command theory because that's, you know, it was in the, it was in the book. I always taught the youth for a dilemma and it just sort of captured my interest, captured my imagination. And the more I looked into it, the more I thought this is a really important dilemma and, and it, it's an important issue. And a lot of people are making mistakes about it, and they continue to make mistakes about it. A lot of people, even experts in the field, seem to me to be um, not quite getting it right. Um, so I sort of just continue to develop, learn more and learn more, and then um, started writing about it. Um, and that sort of was my entry point into philosophy of religion. I w I've been an atheist since at least 16 or 17, but it wasn't a big transition for me. It wasn't a, an emotional event to, to become an atheist. I just decided one day that, or I don't know if it was a day, but I decided at some point I didn't believe in God. But it wasn't something that occupied me. It wasn't something that I, it wasn't a crisis point in my life. Um, but as I entered philosophy of religion through this sort of doorway of ethics, I, 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 invest, I sort of read other stuff and got more and more interested in it. Why do I think it's important? Well, um, I think that religion is a way that people have always uh, spoken about or tried to articulate a sense of what's important. Um, and so when we talk about religion, that's a kind of way of talking about stuff that's important, maybe in a kind of ultimate sense. And I really care about stuff that's important. I really care about the idea of importance, and I think that it, it's a it's a topic that that we should all be thinking about a lot. Um, so, talking about God is sort of talking about what's ultimately significant, um, and so it's just fascinating for me to to think about that kind of thing. And I think that's true generally, um, certainly true for for my students. Um, when I teach introduction to philosophy. The, the topics that get the most interest, I think, are within the philosophy of religion. Now, maybe that's my own enthusiasm, but but I think it it, it, it connects to something with them as well. So, well, just a quick follow up: were you, were you a philosopher before you became an atheist? What, were you were a Christian or some other kind of theist beforehand, or were you like did the transition happen while you were already teaching philosophy, or slightly before? It happened before. So I I, I um. I grew up Catholic um, and went to church regularly until maybe age 13 or 14. I can't quite remember. Um, 
but I wouldn't say I became an atheist until later teens, 16, 17, something like that. Ah. Um, so it was well before I got into philosophy. Um, I, I don't think I really knew what philosophy was when I was 17 years old. Um, I, I mean, I knew what <laughs> I'd heard of the term, but I don't think I really knew what was involved. Um, so yeah, I, I was, uh, I was an atheist before becoming a philosopher. Ah, uh, that make I I when I heard sixteen seventeen, I thought you meant like the last two years. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a confusion. No, no, no. Yeah, when I was sixteen, so quite a while ago. <laughs> um. Okay. So I guess the the best place to go from here is to lay out the Euthyphro dilemma. Um. Now you were saying earlier that uh, even scholars today are making mistakes with mm-hmm. this Euthyphro dilemma. So what do you think is the, how do you think is the best way to lay out the dilemma? Because there's several ways to lay it out. Mm-hmm. So what do you think is probably one of the, the best or easiest ways to um, frame this dilemma? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, when I teach, I, I teach the dialogue. So we read um, Plato's dialogue Euthyphro and we and in the dialogue it is set in the context first of all of polytheistic religion and, and second of all in the context of what the gods love um, and so we talk about it in the, in, in the context of, of love and, and the gods love um, but but when I think about it and when I write about it I'm always thinking about it in the context of commands and that's because I'm thinking about it um, as it relates to the divine command theory Um and, and I think that um, the way in which the Euthyphro dilemma crops up in contemporary philosophical discussions is certainly in the context of divine command theory, or perhaps in with respect to arguments, uh, moral arguments for the existence of God. Um, so I think I. I I think that putting it in terms of, or, or describing the dilemma in terms of what God commands and why he commands it is the best. So if you do that, then the question uh, that um, yields the dilemma is, does God command uh, what is right because it is right, or is the right right because God commands it? And I, we could flesh those options out a little bit more, but... That's sort of my sense of, of a, at least a pretty good way of presenting the dilemma. I agree because we the I think part of the the plausibility of it is that it can feel analogous to how um, finite authorities, like you know, a police officer would issue a command to someone, and then that person would have an obligation to obey that command. So it's got that kind of intuitive appeal. Mm-hmm. Um, to it in, the, in that it's kind of analogous because uh, obviously more contemporary versions of divine command theory, the modified divine command theory, they they have extra things on that don't involve his commands. Like they, they appeal to things like God's nature. Mm-hmm. And they try to say that like, you know, good and bad, moral good and bad. Are, but um, that move I don't think is, is, is plausible. I don't think it captures that intuitive appeal quite like the command version, you know, uh, commands constituting our obligations. Would you agree more or less with that? Yes, I think I would. Um, there's an interesting uh, issue here. That maybe I, we can probably set this aside, but I'll just mention it now. And that is, it, actually, I think if you put it in the context of the military, it might even be more appealing. Um, you know, if a superior officer gives one of his... Uh, subordinates a command the subordinate is obligated to obey that command in the military that seems completely intuitive we can grasp that intuitively and so if we think of God as like um, a superior officer in a military context we can understand the analogy there's a complication because a military officer gets his authority by being embedded in a context a larger context that, that provides that authority to him, whereas God doesn't have any such larger context. Um, and one of the uh, one of the things that would be we, we should make note of at some point is the distinction between 
normative divine command theory uh, and metaethical divine command theory. This is a distinction that I get that I got from um, Mark Mark Murphy. You can find it in his book, an essay on divine authority. So, according to Murphy, normative divine command theory is the view that we have. There's one overriding moral principle, and that is that God is to be obeyed. That's normative divine command theory, whereas metaethical divine command theory says that all um, moral statuses, or at least moral statuses of a certain kind, maybe that's the ontic status, rightness and wrongness, or maybe it's all moral status, including goodness and badness, the, the axiological properties, that all of those are some subset of those uh, depend upon God's commands. Now, the interesting thing is that the normative divine command theory is not consistent with metaethical divine command theory, but that's sort of getting ahead of ourselves. Maybe we can return to that at a later and a little bit later. So, b- while we were getting ready for this episode, we were reading through your paper that was published about a year ago. Um, it's uh, God's love is irrelevant to the Euthyphro problem. Mm-hmm. And if anybody's familiar with the moral argument, they know that the stock response to say uh, to the Euthyphro dilemma is to say that there is a third option, right? That um, the what what really matters is the com- our moral obligations are constituted by the commands of a loving God, and so this is to bypass the idea that morality is arbitrary. Right, so God couldn't command us to torture infants for fun because his nature is the good or um, he is constrained by his nature, which is necessarily good. And so he couldn't give that command. And in your paper, you took a, a very interesting take on that response that I had never seen before. Um, would you be able to give us a quick overview of that? I will, but I wonder, it might be helpful to just take a step back for a moment because one of the, one of the things I said in the paper that I think is worth talking about here is that the, the Euthyphro problem is kind of multifaceted. So, so there's a problem that comes out of the dilemma and it's a problem for, uh, divine command theory. Um, and, that problem is sometimes just we talk about it in terms of arbitrariness, but I think that doesn't quite get at what the issue is. There's, there's a way of stating the problem quickly, and that's just well, if if uh, if moral value or even if it's just moral obligations, if they depend upon God, um, then since God's all powerful, He can command anything He wants, and so He could command that we torture babies or do something else cruel. Now, sometimes uh, when talking about that, what philosophers say is that uh, this is supposed to this this problem, this objection is is supposed to be that God, if if divine command theory is true, then then morality is arbitrary because God's commands are arbitrary. And and yes, that's right. But I think there's more to it than that. So let me let me say that um, I think there are actually three problems that are best kept distinct. They're interrelated, but I think it's best to keep them distinct. So one is arbitrariness. Uh, so if um, moral value depends on God's commands, then um, moral value is arbitrary because God's commands are arbitrary. You know, God can God has no reasons for commanding one thing rather than another. He, yes, he can command that we help our neighbors, but he could also command that we damage our neighbors, that we hurt them in some way. And it's just up to him. He's got no reason to do one thing rather than the other. So that's the problem of arbitrariness. Close, closely related to that is the problem of contingency. Um, so intuitively, it seems that at least some moral truths are, tr- you know, assuming they are true, they're true of necessity. So take something like it's wrong to torture a child gratuitously. That seems necessarily wrong in the sense that it couldn't possibly be otherwise. It couldn't possibly be the case that it's obligatory or permissible to torture um, a child uh, gratuitously. Um, so if divine command theory is true, then it implies that that all world claims are contingent. They could be otherwise. Okay, so that's the contingency problem. And then there's another problem, which I, in the paper, I, I call uh, the problem of counterintuitive uh, consequences. So 
Um, and, and again, these are all closely related, but I think it's important to keep them distinct. So, uh, if divine command theory is true, then it, it, it's, it could be the case, uh, maybe for all we know, if we, we want to add that to it, that something cruel is obligatory. Um, but there's more to it. Th- there are more possibilities than that. It's not just that. It could be that something um, kind is morally wrong. So God might command that we not help our neighbors, for example. Um, or it could be that something neutral, something like, uh, say, brushing your teeth three times a day, uh, which we'll just grant is morally neutral. Uh, God could command that we do that. In, in that case, something that seems intuitively neutral might be obligatory or the opposite. He could command that we not do it, in which case something that seems neutral could be um, morally wrong. So there are three distinct aspects of, of, of what I call the Euthyphro problem. There's the problem of arbitrariness, the problem of contingency, and the problem of counterintuitive consequences. So hopefully that was useful, uh, but I wanted to have that background before we get into one of the standard responses to the Euthyphro problem, which, as you say, concerns an appeal to God's nature. I definitely think that's useful because um, I'm certainly guilty of this in that I think... Uh, um, the arbitrariness and the implausible consequences when I've definitely been blurring those two. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, 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 I think a lot of times I've, or at least in my own thinking about it, God could command us to do something seemingly horrific because his commands are arbitrary. There's no reason for him to do it, you know, to, to either command it or not command it. You're saying to keep those distinct, which I I think that is very useful. I think um, yeah, because it, one has to do with um, our justification, whereas the other one has to do with just okay. These are just implausible implications of the theory, mm-hmm. and so those would be two different. I I definitely see the use in keeping those distinct. Also, I think before going on, omnipotence. So omnipotence plays a, a crucial role in um, your paper. And so we, um, I've always understood omnipotence as God being able to do anything of which the description was coherent. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it certainly seems like if you know God commanded us to kill and eat our children – the description of that is logically coherent. So mm-hmm. it's the, 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 uh, divine command theorists has, has to say, no, it's impossible for God to issue such a ma- command, but they can't do that on logical grounds. They right. have to appeal to something else. And you call it, I believe it was the appeal to love. Is, right. uh, is that right? That's correct. Um, I, I think it's been called that before. Um, I don't think that was something I came up with, but I can't remember where I got okay, it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so right, and actually, um, so now we're getting into the the kind of standard response um, on behalf of the proponents of divine command theory, um, where we can name some names, though, when we name people's names here, we have to understand that their views are subtly distinct. We shouldn't group them all together. But Robert Adams is a, is a good example of a modern contemporary defender of divine command theory. And uh, uh, Philip Quinn is another one. Uh, and then there are others who um, who defended and, and not necessarily... I mean, Adams and Quinn kind of broke ground with the theory uh, in the over the last... Um, well, 40 years, I guess. And then there are others like William Lane Craig, who hasn't really contributed anything, uh, I don't think anything novel to the theory, but he defends it prominently, and he's, he's, he's definitely an adept defender of the theory. I um, mean, there are other people like that. But but the the, 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 the line you kind of you hear from from people um, who, are, who are proponents of divine command theory um, is that, God's uh, God's commands are constrained by His nature, um, and so His His nature is is that He's loving. He's essentially a loving being. Uh, one of the first places this came across was um, in a paper called "A Defensible Divine, Divine Command Theory" by Edward 
Waringa, and I may, may be pronouncing his last name wrong. Um, but anyway, uh, he says that the, 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 the typical theist is going to say, well, God is a loving God, and he's essentially loving. If he's essentially loving, then there's no possible world in which he isn't loving. And it seems reasonable to say that a loving being, uh, it's impossible that a loving being commands something cruel, like, again, the torture of a small child. So that's how they reach the conclusion that it's impossible for God to command these something cruel. Does that make sense? It does, but and, and so and again, uh, keeping your things distinct from earlier, that show that this addresses the implausible consequences of the theory portion, but it doesn't seem to address the justification part of the arbitrariness. It so we the, you could say because uh, uh, I'm using the Bernard Williams distinction here between internal and external reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, we're saying that, look, God has this certain motivational set Mm -hmm. and he has that motivational set essentially. And so these seemingly horrendous or cruel acts just wouldn't follow from that, um, motivational set. But that's not to say that those actions are justified in an externalist sense, in the sense that there are considerations which count in favor of God issuing these commands. Right. Um, so um, I would I would use the distinction between motives and normative reasons rather than Williams internal versus external reasons, but there, those yeah. are closely related distinction. Um, so uh, here, here I'll quote um, William Lane Craig who is uh, among his virtues are that he um, can ex- can explain things in very um, simple ways. Uh, so he's got at least a couple different videos on YouTube where he's responding to the euthyphro problem. And what he says more than once is that uh, the euthyphro dilemma is a false dilemma because there's a third option. It's not that uh, God commands uh, the right because it is right, nor is it that right actions are right because God commands them. Rather, what we should say, according to Craig, is that God commands the right. I think he says good. God commands the good because he is good. God commands the good because he, God, is good. Um, but that doesn't seem to address the um, arbitrariness worry. When we say that God is good, we're talking about God's character, I think, I mean, maybe there's more truth than that, but at least at first blush, it seems like we're talking about God's character, and that shows that God acts on certain kinds of motives. Uh, he, 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 he is motivated to have concern for others, he's motivated by love of others, but that his commands are motivated doesn't show that they're grounded in reasons, in the normative sense of reason. So roughly, the, the, the normative sense of reason is the justifying sense. A, a normative reason tends to justify, whereas a mere motive doesn't necessarily justify. A mere motive might explain uh, why someone did something, but it doesn't necessarily justify that. We could use entirely non-normative terms to describe God's motives. Right, exactly. Yeah, so- if I can inject a second here, um, I guess the question here is um, w- one of the things with the one of the responses to the Euthyphro dilemma, uh, like you just mentioned, was that God is constrained by His nature, and His nat- He is by nature loving, and so one of the responses that I would normally use to this, or that I've heard others use, is that. It seems to push the Euthyphro dilemma back a step. It it would where you could ask, is God loving by nature because loving is good, or is love good because it is in God's nature? And here, um, the defender of divine command theory seems to have to bite the bullet, where people like William Lane Craig will say, love is good only because it is in God's nature. And so if God did not exist, there is nothing about 
There are no facts about love that would make it good absent it being in God's nature, um, which seems wildly counterintuitive. Um, but also, it seems to make any of the properties that would be in God's nature kind of a brute fact in a way. There's no reason for it being there. It just is, and even if they define him as necessary, there's no there's no reason he has any given set of properties over another. There's no reason he's loving rather than hateful. It just kind of is like a brute necessity. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I'm also recalling places where Craig has said things like, uh, God's commands aren't arbitrary because they're grounded in his essential nature. Um, and I think the idea is that because God's nature is essential and also, uh, Craig would add, that God is himself and uh, his existence is necessary, uh, we remove the arbitrariness problem. I I think that's what he thinks, but I, if, if it is what he thinks, then he's conflated the arbitrariness problem with the contingency problem. Uh, so the fact that um, God has the same nature in every possible world and also exists in every possible world doesn't show that God's uh, commands are grounded in reasons. That they're the same always doesn't mean that they are supported by reasons. Or if we're just talking about God's nature, that God's nature is the same doesn't mean that God's nature is grounded in reasons. And so it does seem that if we take... Uh, the position that, that Craig is defending, uh, then we have to say, yeah, there's no reason that, uh, let's say, love is good as opposed to hate. It's just the way it is. That's just the way God is. Now, Craig would say, but it's necessary because in every possible world, God exists and God is loving. Okay, but then, again, you're conflating uh, the contingency problem with the arbitrariness problem. The issue is it seems like there should be a reason why loving is good and hate is bad. Right. It, it seems as if, intuitively at least, there seems to be something about uh, the facts of the matter regard, with regard to love or hatred that makes it right or wrong. Right. It doesn't seem uh, like, let's say, two people in love, we would call that good, um, even if God didn't exist. It seems to have no bearing on whether or not their love is good. Right. Exactly. It also seems to to make so on this modified version of divine command theory, it seems to make God's nature the only thing of intrinsic value, and everything else merely has extrinsic value in how it relates to God's nature, and that seems like a strange implication to me, because using love, love seems like an intrinsic value to me. It seems like something that we all have external reasons to care about for its own sake and right. then not merely extrinsically valuable but, but but Craig's theory implies that if there is no God then love is valueless we have no reason to prefer it or reject it yes that that, it, that does seem to be an implication of his view but that's not necessarily an implication of every divine command theory that's that's out there. Um, so one, um, one, one other distinction that we ought to make is, is, is one that I've um, kind of relied on in the, in, in, you know, a few minutes ago. And that's the distinction between axiological value and deontic value, where axiological value, value roughly is, is goodness and badness and deontic value is rightness and wrongness, obligatoriness, um, so rough, so the idea is that deontic value is characteristic of actions. Really, it's only actions that can be right or wrong or obligatory. Um, uh, but states of affairs, objects, uh, persons, and, and maybe actions as well can have axiological value. So an object can't be right or wrong in the deontic sense, but it can be good or bad. So, um, if we, if we like that distinction, and I think most ethicists acknowledge it, doesn't seem to be problematic distinctions. In fact, it seems to be an important one. Then you could be a divine command theorist about deontic value, rightness and wrongness, or even maybe a subset of deontic value, uh, but not a divine command theorist about axiological value. 
uh, and think of it at the very least, goodness and badness is independent of, of divine commands. Okay. That's, that's an that's interesting good, point. That's a very interesting, yes. The, this is the way that uh, Robert Adams articulates his view, although Adams also claims that God is the good and that goodness just is resemblance to God, but set that aside. So he has a substance, a substantive account of the good, which is distinct from his account of um, obligations, obligatoriness, uh, but set aside his axiological worry for now because it's a non-command uh, theory, non-divine command theory explanation of axiological value. Set that aside. If we just think, well, look, uh, states of affairs can be good and bad, actions can be good and bad, then on, on that view, God can have reasons to command something, uh, command that we uh, help our neighbors and command that we not torture. And those reasons have to do with the with axiological properties. So torture uh, causes pain and, and uh, un- uh, unjust pain. If we can, if we can make unjust just a dis- descriptive property, then um, we can say God's reason for commanding that we not torture is that it has that torture has the axiological property of being bad, um, or at least producing bad consequences. Uh, so that seems like it might resolve the problem we've got a we've got a locus for god's reasons and that locus is the axiological value that is independent of god's commands so is this is this fair to to make sure i'm tracking right is this fair to say that we could have moral values which would be independent of god but our moral obligations would be dependent upon god's commands right so we have to be careful on the view i'm sketching what we can say is that we can have moral value, in particular axiological value, which is independent of God's commands, whereas deontic value, rightness and wrongness, would be dependent on God's commands. Now, we don't want to say, at least if we're talking about Robert Adams' view, we don't want to say that axiological value is completely independent of God uh, because that isn't what he thinks. But he does think it's independent of God's commands. Okay. So... One of the interesting things about your paper um, is where you talk about um, the problematic part of divine command theory is that God has the power to give us obligations. Um, so that is just a, it's kind of like a power that he has. Um, and that you could appeal to other possible omnipotent beings that are not omnibenevolent that could then have the same power by virtue of them being omnipotent um, and then they could command something horrendous which is counterintuitive. Exactly. So the way I lay out the argument in the paper is that it's it's kind of an objection to the view that the appeal to love and talking about God's nature resolves the contingency problem and the counterintuitive consequences problem. Um, So my claim is that uh, divine command theory attributes to God a property that I call moral grounding power. And that moral grounding power is the power to uh, make it the case that we're morally obligated to do X or Y, whatever. Uh, So God has the power to make it the case that we are obligated to refrain from torture or we're obligated to help others and he can, he has that power to do that by command. Just by issuing a command, he makes it the case that we're obligated. Um, so if we think of that as a distinct power that God has, then, then I have an argument that the, the, the divine command theory implies that morality really is contingent and there are, uh, counterintuitive consequences. Because after all, uh, it's possible that some, malevolent deity exists and in the paper I call this deity asura which is, which is actually it's a Sanskrit word that is a, is a general kind term referring to a type of uh, malicious or malevolent or at least capricious deity but I've turned it into a proper name in the in the, in the paper um, so asura is a malevolent deity but he's omnipotent and creator of the universe and, and omniscient and so forth um, but now he has a nature, and we'll assume it's essentially uh, malevolent. Uh, 
Um, and so he will issue commands like, uh, thou shalt torture um, small children. If, if, if that's possible, then uh, it seems like divine command theory implies that there are possible worlds where torturing children is obligatory. Right. That, that's, that's a sketch of the argument, at least. So um, there's two points I kind of want to highlight here. Um, one of the interesting moves uh, or that you've made in the paper was a, a normal response to that that uh, divine command theorists would have is that they would say, well, look, uh, we define God as a necessary being so that um, that omnimenevolent being you've just defined is it is not possible that it can exist um and i think you had a very interesting response to that where the argument just shifts to being an epistemic argument could you maybe elaborate on that right so um i am suspicious of the claim that we can rule out the existence of a sura or any other um deity on the basis of the fact that God's existence is necessary because if, if if that move works, if we can say, well, God necessarily exists and though, and therefore Asura doesn't exist, well, a parallel argument rules out would rule out God's existence. After all, I could say, well, but, you know, the thing about Asura is that he exists necessarily and therefore God doesn't exist. And in fact, it's not possible that God exists. And I can't see any reason to prefer one inference rather than the other. Um, so so I'm very skeptical of the idea that we can rule out the uh, the existence of a surah just on the basis of God's alleged necessary existence. Um, but suppose we could. Suppose we we said, um, well, at best we could say, well, well, whichever divine being exists, uh, at least the omnipotent, omniscient creator, whether that creator is malevolent or benevolent, its existence is necessary. Maybe we could, let's suppose we could establish that, um, and I'm skeptical that we could, but suppose we could, um, then we would still have a, an epistemic problem because we don't know for certain what the nature of this divine, of the divine being that is necessary is that is it's, even if we know that there is a necessary divine being, we don't know whether he's benevolent or malevolent. Um, and so, uh, for all we know, he is in fact malevolent, and thus issues commands such as "Thou shalt torture small children." And so, if that were right, then for all we know, uh, torturing children is obligatory. But or that, being analogous to a cosmic Hitler could be the good, quote unquote. <laughs> Yeah, this this evil deity's nature would be the good if we take Robert Adams' view. Uh, apparently, um, he he would he would reject that for reasons that probably are we can set aside. But it does seem intuitive that if if we're going to say God's nature is the good, uh, then a serf's nature would be the good as well if he exists. And it, but that just seems completely wrong. But the, and, and here's the point: it it seems like. The, the upshot of, 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 the, of the epistemological argument is if divine command theory were true, then we wouldn't know whether tor- torture of children is, is right or wrong. But, of course, that's false. We do know, and, and we know that it's wrong. And so, therefore, divine command theory can't be true. Okay. Um, so we have a, a, a good friend of ours, Frederick Chu, um, who has tried to cash out this third option. So I don't, I don't actually think there is a, a, a genuine third option, but he tries to cash it out in the sense that, so he says that the first two horns are that God has no reasons for his commands, or God has reasons for his commands, and those reasons are sufficient for moral obligation. But then he, his third option is, look, God does have reasons for his commands, but those reasons by themselves are not sufficient for moral obligations. Now, I see this as just a variation of one of the Euthyphro horns, and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me if 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 there are reasons which can constrain God's will such that he should, ought, or must not issue certain commands, well, then those reasons should be sufficient for us, too. Um, do you think that this move can get any traction? Do you think that, that 
that there's any real way to derive a legitimate third option from uh, this. Right. I, I I haven't come across one, and I don't think that Chu's example uh, or Chu's solution works. But let me set, set it set it in context. So he's um he's defending what uh, what I think I call the restricted. Uh, divine command theory, um, that, uh, that idea of, of, of restrictions that comes from Mark Murphy in a paper he calls, uh, called, uh, restricted theological volunteerism. But earlier I said that you could have a view where, um, divine commands account for deontic value, but not axiological value. That, I think, is Chu's position. At least his position fits in that category. He's defending something like that. He's actually defending the view that, um, Baggett and Walls uh, articulate in their book Good God, um, and that's definitely their view that 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 they're defending a, a uh, divine command theory of deontic value of, of rightness and wrongness. Okay, so um, he's so that view, as you correctly state, is subject to the arbitrariness argument, which is different than the arbitrariness problem. So the arbitrariness argument is either God has reasons for his commands or he doesn't. If he doesn't have reasons, then his commands are arbitrary and hence they cannot ground uh, deontic value or moral obligations. If he does have reasons for his commands, then it's those reasons rather than his commands that ground obligations. So uh, Chu wants to say God has reasons uh, for his commands. Uh, In fact, he says in that uh, article, God has to have reasons for his commands. But he wants to also say that those reasons aren't enough to make the actions um, obligatory. But as you point out, that would, that's weird. And and Mark Murphy makes the same point in the paper I just mentioned. Uh, your suggest the suggestion is that 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 God is justified in issue these issuing the commands he does and that the axiological values of actions and states of affairs justify him they count in favor of his commands uh, and yet at the same time you're going to say that these same axiological values um, of the states of affairs and actions don't uh, justify us acting in that way uh, that just seems weird. Why would God's command be justified by these factors, but our acting in that way not be justified? There seems to be no explanation for why this would be. So I think that that by taking this alleged third option, uh, Chu has fallen prey to the arbitrariness argument that we have to say, well, look, uh, no, uh, if God has reasons, then it's those reasons that ground our obligations. So, uh, to follow up on that, we have a related question from one of our co-hosts who couldn't be here tonight, Ben Bevar, um, and he he had a, a question I really wanted to ask, and it seems related here. Um, one of the things that uh, Chu would respond with is to say that uh, to have the moral granting power, as you uh, call it, is that you would have to have omnibenevolence because having omnibenevolence along with omnipotence is what gives the being the power to create the moral obligations. And when I I think you address this in the paper, but I would really like to have you expand on it. It seems as though your response was um, there's no reason to think that they haven't given us an argument to suppose that. Correct. Uh, Right, so so uh, there's an important move that I make in the argument, which is um, any, any god that is omnipotent is going to have the same powers that God has. So any deity that's omnipotent is going to have the same powers that God has. Um, that seems intuitively right. If God can create a universe, uh, then any other deity that is equally powerful, that is also omnipotent, can create a universe. So the, the deity that I've imagined, um, that I called Asura, uh, is omnipotent, um, and so he's going to have any powers that God has. Well, if God has moral grounding power, then Asura will as well. So if someone says to me, uh, well, no, you have to be benevolent 
in order to have moral grounding power, then the question is, well, why would that be? That seems implausible. A God has the ability to make a planet. A Sura has the ability to make a planet. If you suggested that planet creation depended on benevolence, we would that would not be that would be very counterintuitive. Why would you have to be good in order to have the power to create a planet? Um, and so, by the same token, it, it doesn't seem that uh, benevolence should be required for any particular power, including moral grounding power. Chu uh, also presses an analogy with um, like legal laws. So he uh, part of what he wants to argue is that look, um, reason you know laws our legal laws are based on reasons, but those reasons themselves are not sufficient to give rise to legal obligations. And so he wants to say that this is similar to God. And this is like, look, he has reasons. There are reasons for God to issue his commands. But those reasons by themselves are not sufficient to morally obligate us to do certain things. It takes that command. That command is the the extra ingredient that is required to get that moral obligation. Right. Um, But that makes morality much... It's... It, could, should we uh, allow that move that morality is like a legal system? I don't think so. I, I think that there are two moves that that Chu could make here, and I think he's chosen the worst of the two. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know. I could be wrong about that. But it seems to me that in, in in suggesting the legal analogy, he's falling into defending a normative divine command theory. So. I made that distinction way back at the beginning of our discussion, the distinction between normative divine command theory and meta-ethical divine command theory. And the the the, the proper object of, of criticism for Euthyphro-style objections is the meta-ethical view, which again is the view that some subset of moral properties uh, are, are, are dependent on divine commands, that divine commands fully and immediately explain uh, some subset of moral properties, or maybe the entire realm of moral properties. Um, the normative divine command theory says that, that we have one overriding principle, and that is that God is to be obeyed. The important thing is that that principle cannot be accounted for, for by a divine command. So normative divine command theory doesn't explain where that principle comes from. We are obligated to obey God, but there's no basis for that obligation, certainly not a basis in God and certainly not a basis in his command. Uh, that principle is independent of God. It's independent of everything. There's just this fundamental principle, God is to be obeyed. So because of that, actually, normative divine command theory is not consistent with metaethical divine command theory because metaethical divine command theory is going to say that, no, it's uh, it, at least if it's a, an account of deontic value, that all deontic value is accounted for a virtue of, of God's commands. Well, here on normative divine command theory, here's this uh, here's this principle, this moral principle that makes actions right or wrong. That's completely independent of God, right? So the two are the two views are not the same, even though both are called divine command theories, and they're importantly different and incompatible. So, would it be fair to say that to the, the where the base obligation comes from? Um, it's just kind of this necessary fact, if assuming that it is a fact. Um, so they say, well, we just have this obligation to obey God, and that's just what divine command theory would uh, supposedly posit. Uh, wouldn't say, wouldn't we be free to theorize about another way that we could derive obligations, like say from? our ability to apprehend the good and to think rationally about how we should act. Could we say, you know, if, if we're just going to assume this moral grounding power for at least our obligations, we could just posit, you know, something and we would just evaluate uh, the one theory versus the other. Right. So a different way of saying that is that normative divine command theory is extremely implausible. Once we grant that there can be independent uh, sort of freestanding moral principles of which, you know, uh, the the requirement that we obey God is one. 
why why couldn't there be others? Why would that be the only one? Why wouldn't uh, you know we should respect uh, the dignity of all persons be one? Uh, you know, uh, to, to borrow something from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, why shouldn't that be a fundamental principle? Right? Why should there only be one, and why should it be this one? So normative divine command theory is incredibly implausible. Um, so, but to go back to 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 Chu's uh, position, he wants to rely on this analogy with uh, legal systems where you have to have a legislative authority in order to create the legal obligation. Well, the problem is that the legislative authority gets its authority from something external to it. No one thinks that just any person can be a, a legislative authority or no, no person has legislative authority. It's got to be embedded in something else. And, you know, we would be getting into political philosophy if we tried to offer an account of, of where legislative authority comes from or, or what it's grounded in, rather. Um, but at the very least, everyone who thinks about this is going to acknowledge that there's got to be some account that legislative authority uh, isn't created ex nihilo by the legislative authority. They get it from some other, with the help of some other principle, probably a, an ethical principle, certainly a normative principle, Something like this authority, the United States Congress or whatever it is, has the authority to pass laws, has the authority authority to, to thereby create legal obligations. Now, so if the analogy holds between the legislative authority and God, then by the same token, God's authority would have to need would need the help of something else. It would rely on something external, like the principle that God is to be obeyed. But that's normative divine command theory, right? The, the very implausible view that we've already dismissed. It's not meta-ethical divine command. And so, you know, you can respond to Chu in the following way. Well, if this is your view, if you're defending normative, the normative divine command theory, then you agree that, that there's at least one uh ethical truth, or at least normative truth, that's independent of divine commands. And and why this one? Why only this one? Why couldn't there be... Why, why wouldn't there be others? Uh, we've... we've I've expressed this objection similarly in just in, in posing it as a question, in okay. saying, you know, look, if, if, if God's commands are the only thing that could ground a moral obligation, well then what grounds our moral obligation to obey God's commands? And... Well, uh, that to me, it seems like you you have to appeal to that principle that would be outside of God. Uh, Swinburne takes it, takes this route, for example. He says that look, we have a moral obligation to please our benefactors, and God's our greatest benefactor. But that truth, that 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 more general moral truth, can't depend on God. Right, and and. And it's important to recognize that, that that involves a rejection of meta-ethical divine command theory because, again, the hope is, is I think this is Chu's view at least, that, that divine command theory is going to give us an account of all deontic value. It's going to explain why it is that any morally uh, obligatory action is morally obligatory, but that if we take the normative route and say, well, there, we, we have this overriding independent obligation to obey God, then that, that, that hope is lost. We haven't, we haven't accounted for all deontic value. Does that make it sense? It also seems difficult to, so one of the essential theological claims of theism is that God is perfectly good. Mm -hmm. Well, if we're also saying that God's nature is identical to the good, when we say God is perfectly good, what are, what are, what are we saying? How do we make sense of that claim? How do we cash out that claim? It seems to me that we can really only cash that claim out in a substantive way if we assume that, um, goodness is independent of God. We say, we would say that, look, we can, we ascribe this property of goodness to God, and that has implications in the way it constrains the way God's nature could be. You could say, if, if, if we take this view, we could say, well, God couldn't be analogous to, analogous to a cosmic Hitler because being a cosmic Hitler is not in itself good. Um, it seems like the modified divine command theorist loses any a priori way of saying this without appeal to what you're saying, like these, 
higher order normative principles of deontic value and axiological value. So I guess there's, a, there's several things in your question um, or your comment. I think to go back to the, the issue with the normative divine command theory, um, the meta-ethical view, the meta-ethical divine command theory doesn't rely on any claim that we're obligated to obey God's command. That's not the view. The view is that, that to, to take a, to take Adam's view, the view is that our obligations are constituted or identical to, uh, divine commands. Mm-hmm. In the same way that, uh, and he uses this analogy in the same that, that, that water or samples of water are identical to samples of H2O. Um, so there, there, there need, there need, there need be no background theoretical apparatus to explain why it is we're obligated to obey God on Adam's view. No. God's commands just are moral obligations. So doesn't that make the claim God is good, that's the is of identity rather than the is of predication, right? That is correct. Uh, on Adam's view, God is the good, and so it, that is the is of identity. Yeah. Okay, so, so to, yeah, uh, I, I guess that that to me seems like it would have theological implications that are just unacceptable. But I'm an atheist from the outside looking in, so perhaps I'm, that's my own bias talking. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't make sense of it either. Um, I, but I would say that that so that that problem is sometimes called the divine ascription problem. How do we ascribe goodness to God if God is the good or is the standard of good? And I, again, I don't know that there's a good solution. Uh, people have written a lot of words about it, but I can't, I, I, and maybe this is just my limitation. I can't seem to see how we get around that problem, but that is a different problem than um, what we've been talking about with respect to what comes the arbitrariness, contingency, and, and, and uh, counterintuitive consequences problem. That's a sort of a, a separate problem, though it's obviously related. Sure. Can I say one other thing about um, going back to the, the, the Chu, uh, to, to his position? Um, this is a, a subtle complication. What he could have said um, is that, so the problem was, if God has reasons for his command, then those are also reasons for us. So if God has reasons to command that we give money to the poor, then whatever reasons he has are also reasons for us to give money to the poor. Um, as I understand it, she wants to say that, that well, giving money to the poor is axiologically good, and in fact there are reasons for us to give money to the poor that's independent of God. However... It's not obligatory to give money to the poor in the absence of God's commands. So it's kind of an interesting position. We would have reason to give money to the poor, but it wouldn't be obligatory. And Those and, reasons I mean, aren't sufficient. They're right? not exactly. And if you don't think giving to the poor is, is obligatory, think of something that is. You know, again, it could be something like don't torture babies. Uh, it, she would say, well, torturing babies would be axiologically bad, and we would have reasons to refrain from it, but it wouldn't be obligatory to refrain from torture. Without God, I just don't see what value that's adding uh, to to like I don't see how that is what makes it sufficient. Um, right. There's a a view that um, that that Mark Murphy actually attributes to Robert Adams, which is that it isn't all the ontic status, it isn't all the ontic value that that divine commands account for. It's it's only a subset of the ontic value. Uh, obligatoriness. So, uh, according to Murphy, on Adam's view, uh, there's deontic value, rightness, and wrongness, but then over and above that, there's obligatoriness. So, an action could be right and not obligatory. So, what makes something obligatory on Adam's view is that uh, God commands it. In the absence of God's command, it would still be right, but it wouldn't be obligatory. So then the question would be, well, what, and this is what, uh, this is Murphy's position. It's similar to what you were saying, uh, John. What, 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 
how how does God's command make it obligatory? What, I mean, what are we adding here that isn't already there? You know. Um, yeah, it's always seemed to me that that these attempts are are they're, they're just attempts to kind of insert the metaphysics of theism into the clockwork of metaethics. And it just always kind of seems to leave these questions open. It seems it seems to create more problems than it solves. I right. guess what I'm getting well, at. I guess one thing I think maybe it could add uh, would go back to Chu's analogy of the legislature. So he says the legislature has reasons to enact its laws, but it, those laws don't become obligatory until they're passed by the legislature. I think where I would say the disanalogy is is that there's a difference between legal and moral, um, and so those reasons would be sufficient to make it morally obligatory, but not legally obligatory. And I think really the only thing that divine command theory or theism, when you tie theism to ethics, is that you get not moral ontology or moral obligation, but moral enforcement. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. So you you have, hey, look, I have decreed that you ought to do X, Y, Z, and if you don't, you are liable for punishment. And an atheistic account of morality cannot get that for you. But lacking that does not um, kind of violate any of our intuitions. It doesn't. We don't lose an objective right and wrong or an account of obligation in general. It's just that there is no cosmic justice. Right. Um, I would say I, I've encountered people who say that if there is no cosmic justice, then there's no right or wrong either. But I find that view to be very odd. I, I don't see it as intuitive at all. Let me say one other thing about um, this: the 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 Adams the the Mur- Adams view as described by by Murphy, which is again that it's only obligatoriness that divine commands account for. Um, it seems to me that you have an arbitrariness problem here again because so so suppose you take two actions that are uh, equally um, well I don't know about what we want to say equally but they have uh, this they have a uh, deontic status uh, maybe both are right um, and uh, God commands one and not the other well why uh, God's got to have some reason to command one and not the other if they're both right. Well, uh, either he's got a reason or he doesn't. If he doesn't have a reason, then it's, it's just arbitrary that this action is obligatory. And if he does have a reason, well, then those two options have different uh, moral features, and those moral features are independent of God and seem to be enough to make the one obligatory, the one that he commands, independent of his command. Um, I wanted to say one more thing on the the legislator legislature analogy um, that I, so the way I've been thinking about this is I've been using the distinction that Parfit uses between a rule implying sense of normativity and a reason implying sense of normativity. Mm -hmm. And so I would want to say that, you know, legal laws are normative in the rule implying sense, similar to how rules of etiquette or traffic laws um, are normative. We could cash them out in purely non-normative, descriptive terms. But what matters morally is the reason implying sense of normativity, the, the, the one that justifies. And so I think if you accept this distinction, that pretty much undermines that analogy. Would you agree with that? Or that I've, I haven't quite decided where I am with my thinking on this yet. Yes, um, I do. I, I think you're right, but wouldn't, couldn't someone say, well, look, yes, there's a distinction between something that's, uh, legally binding and something that's morally binding. Um, however, aren't we morally obligated to obey the law? Depends on whether or not it's a just law. After all, the Holocaust well, was legal. Yeah, so that's where we <laughs> say that the reason in applying sense, uh, you know, the moral sense constrains the rule implying sense. So like we don't have any obligation to obey unjust laws 
just like going back to your military example, you know, soldiers don't have an obligation to obey, you know, immoral commands from their superiors. So they do have an obligation to obey the orders of their superiors, but, you know, their superiors can't say, you know, go terrorize this village. Well, the superiors can say drop this bomb on this town. I mean, the way you put it suggests that that the, the, the people operating the planes that dropped uh, the nuclear bombs in Japan didn't have um, an obligation to obey the commands because they were immoral. I mean, if we, if we grant that they were immoral. Sure. Um, which which may, might be right, but I don't think the military is going to take that line. No. <laughs> well, well, there are maybe things. Maybe a so, better example would be Hitler and his Third Reich. You know, these German soldiers, you know, these, you know, 18, 19 year old kids didn't have any good reason or moral reason to carry out the orders from their officers. In fact, they had moral reasons not to do that. I think I, I, I would want to say that. I wouldn't want to, it would seem very strange to me to say that those soldiers had a moral obligation to carry out the orders of the Third Reich. That seems strange to me. But maybe, you know, hey. Well, have any of us served in the military? Um, I, I, I work for the Department of Defense and uh, for the Navy. So like I, I, I'm not in the Navy, but I've seen kind of the, the structures of the Navy so to speak. So I've got some familiarization with it. Okay. So I think the one thing I was going to say was that I think there are specific things that are spilled out or spelled out in, say, the Geneva Convention in terms of what a war crime technically would consist of and that soldiers are not obligated to follow the commands of, um, you know, like if something would be a war crime, which is very tightly defined, mm-hmm. then they wouldn't be obligated to... Uh, defend that. That's why during the uh, the trials of the Nazi officers, they couldn't say they were just following orders as a defense. Right. Um, maybe you guys know this better than I do, but I, but I suspect what what happens in the military context, at least maybe in, in the United States, is that the the requirement is that subordinates are required uh, to obey lawfully uh, and properly issued commands. Or lawful and properly issued command. So if it's in legal command, you don't, you're not obligated to obey it. Um, but, but that says nothing about moral, right? Uh, so yes. I, I'm not sure that you can object to a command by saying that was an immoral command. I would agree. You can't, you can't necessarily just use that as an excuse to disobey an order. Right. If you thought that no uh, wars of aggression were morally acceptable, then uh, every soldier who went to Iraq uh, would have a would be able to say, "Look, I I'm not going to follow any commands here because they're immoral." So uh, I, th- I think this analogy kind of breaks down mostly because you could say the only moral principle at play was that you should honor your oaths, and when you join the military, you take a very specific oath that spells out a lot of the provisions that would govern these sorts of things, and so. That's where I think we would have a disanalogy between following order, your obligation to follow orders, which is really your obligation to uphold your oath when you enlisted, versus um, following an order that may be immoral, but um, you know you could say dropping a bomb on the town is immoral and hately, um, but you can be ordered to do that in a war. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. Another useful thing that might help here is that. The rule implying sense, uh, or, or, uh, uh, legal laws, those are externally imposed on us, whereas more morality is, is autonomous. It's, it's self-governing. It's, we're giving ourselves principles. It's not externally imposed on us. So I think that could be another way, like, th- that's a relevant difference. I'm not sure if I understand. I, don't you think that if I, uh, if I'm obligated to render aid to a, someone in distress, say someone's choking and I can perform the Heimlich to save them, uh, that obligation 
doesn't that come from them? And isn't that external to me? It is, but but those principles are ones that you've given yourself. It's ones that you could rationally. So I'm thinking of Kant here, saying that you know you could will it to be a universal law in a way. Um, you're 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 saying it, it started. You're you're going within your own sense of reason, and you're acting on principles that you could, you know, in your heart rationally will. Mm-hmm. Whereas mm-hmm. where a legal law. It's imposed on you. It could be an immo- It could be something that doesn't align with your mor- your morality, but it's still imposed on you from outside. Hmm. I'm in a Kant mode right now, so my I'm being poisoned by the Kantians right now. Yeah, that's what uh, <laughs> that's, that's what David Brink told me when he saw me reading um, Christine Korsgaard. He said that'll poison your mind. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I said the same thing when I was, you know, reading the utilitarians, and I was like, "Ah, I'm being poisoned by the utilitarians." <laughs> I, I literally can't even, so I'm, I'm just escaping <laughs> this problem altogether. So I, I'm not sure that I agree uh, with that characterization of the autonomy of morality. I, I, I guess I hadn't thought about it that way, but uh, my first instinct is to think that there, that's not quite. I mean, I, I understand that Kant thought that. I think I think Pop thought, thought something like that. I should say, but I'm not sure that that's the right way to think about it. I I, I tend to think that no moral claims really are external, and and that there's a certain way in which at least some of them, the obligations we owe to persons, uh, conscious agents, really come from them. If I uh, this is an aspect of of, of, Rob, of Robert Adams' view that that I haven't talked about, which is that he mentions that obligation is a social. Uh, social concept that is that it, what that entails is that if I'm obligated I'm obligated to somebody and so if I've done something wrong I've transgressed some uh, something that I should have done for someone or to someone uh, or refrain from doing something to someone so he, he, he puts a lot of emphasis on the idea that morality is a social there's yeah, a social see, I'd, I'd push back on that in in what I was just trying so Using a non-moral example of autonomy, like rationality, I think. My, so, like, I would say that we ought not contradict ourselves. Well, that's not a social thing. It's that's a self-governed. If morality wasn't autonomous, I would think that that's just to opt out of moral thinking altogether. That's just to say, okay, well, I'm going to act in this way because this person told me to do so. Mm-hmm. That, that 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 to me doesn't. Something unique about morality and rationality is the autonomy of it. Is is the way that you can say, okay, look, I'm using my own sense of reason. I'm taking this point of view of the universe, and this is how and this is how I am going to think about it and direct my actions. Right. Whereas, I, I, so when when Adams is saying that you know, well, obligation is this social thing well well yeah there are obligations that are social but that's not the only sort of obligation we have we have these obligations to accept the conclusions of valid arguments with true premises we have obligations not to contradict ourselves things like that but I, I don't I don't know how you'd cash those out in like a social construct sort of thing. Okay so just to briefly say something about Adam's view I think I'm inclined to think that he's right that at least some large subset of our obligations are obligations to persons. Yes. But I see no reason why that person has to be a divine person unless you think that the person to whom you owe the obligation must be capable of enforcing it. Mm -hmm. But but that seems weird. Why would that be? Right. Right. I can owe obligations to someone who's incapable of enforcing it. Well, and it also seems that there's just more plausible theories out there um, if we're going into the normative realm of things like contractualism, where you would just say, look, persons have obligations to treat others in ways that no one could reasonably, you know, that that no one could reasonably reject or something. Um, That to me, and that would include God. God couldn't treat people in ways that were unjustifiable to others. So, you know, that to me seems far more plausible, a contractualist route. You get all of what Rob uh, Adams is 
is talking about, but you wouldn't need that, you know, divine commander. Right. Of it. Exactly. So, 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 right. So I, I, I think that's right. I, I'm sort of inclined more towards a, a view that Stephen Darwall defends in a book called Second Person Reasons, um, which essentially says that persons are, are of their nature beings that are capable of making demands. And when we interact with persons, we sort of regard them as beings capable of making demands on us. And, and we also understand that they are capable of making, or we are capable of making demands on them. Um, but, but I, we don't need to get into that. The point is that there are more plausible views of explaining the sociality aspect of, of obligatory, of, of moral obligation. In terms of the autonomy of ethics, um, I guess when I've heard, I've heard that phrase before, it's always been in the context of thinking of ethic, ethics and morality as distinct from uh, the natural world and, and not dependent on natural laws in the same way that maybe mathematics is autonomous. So that, uh, uh, even yeah, if, these, it's this, uh, uh, for, unfortunately the word autonomy is a lot like the word naturalism. It has <laughs> many different uses. Cause I've heard it that way too. Yeah. I've also heard that, uh, I've heard it used in the, like if, uh, this distinction between subjective and objective. If it's not dependent on the attitudes or responses of subjects, that's the autonomy autonomy of ethics. Right. So, yeah, I I, I wish there was a better term, and the only ones that I've come up with is like self governing or self directed. Which, right, which is autonomy essentially means self governing. Yeah. So. But but what you're getting at is that the uh, the individual has to endorse, uh, sort of endorse the reason. In order, so they, or in, in constants, you make it your maxim. Yes. Um, and, and I think that's right. We, we definitely have to endorse the reasons, but that doesn't mean that the reasons are internal to us. No, so, no, 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 absolutely right. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm not an internalist. <laughs> I didn't think so, yeah. <laughs> I might be leaning so towards it, but that's a separate topic. <laughs> the story of Isaac, Abraham and Isaac. Mm-hmm. So Abraham, like, if I were in that position, I could not endorse the command to kill my child. Right. But if I were to just opt out of the moral thinking altogether and just blindly follow the command, well, mm-hmm. then morality wouldn't be autonomous in that sense. I'd just be following orders. It'd be something external imposed on me. Mm-hmm. Well, Whereas I would say, you know, I'd want to say, no, look, there are these apparent external reasons that I, that seem to obligate me to do something completely different. Right. So I kind of, I kind of, I, I think I see better what you're talking about. You're, you're saying that when we are acting morally, we are of necessity acting autonomously. Yes. Which, which means we have to make up our own minds. Yes. Uh, and so at the very least, you have to have a dialogue with God. Why is it that you want me to kill Isaac? Uh, <laughs> I I think it should be wor- – it's worth pointing out we talked about at the start how God couldn't command these horrendous acts. But most of the time when we debate d- divine command theory, we're talking about Christians who think God commanded, say, the genocide of the Amalekites – putting broadswords to babies and all that sort of thing. And that even people like William Lane Craig will defend that as morally obligatory. <laughs> I think that's just a point worth making in the it, context of this. It is. But, uh, it, as you know, it's certainly not the case that all Christians believe that God actually commanded the This the is water. true. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Is there anything you'd like to say before we close out, Jason? Just that it was a pleasure, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. If you appreciate the tone and content of what Real Atheology has to offer, please consider writing a review for us on iTunes. All music was created by Work of Wolves. We here at Real Atheology would like to thank our Patreons. Kashi Savarina, Paul Pinos, Richard Kane, Lucas Stewart, Brandon McClarity, John Daney, Michael Topsrud, Roe Wilms, Ed Atkinson, Kid Blachowski, Andrew Schneider, Jason McLuta, St. Nimbus, Bob April, and Alexander Song.
you're interested in supporting Real A Theology, you can please come to our page at patreon.com slash realatheology.